the highway of tomorrow. This is the way it was envisioned in the 1950s. A road out of a science fiction movie where cars drove themselves and passengers marveled at gadgets like in-dash television and automatic headlights. I think the futurists at that time felt that we would all be flying around in jet cars. Uh, you know, the Jetsons and that kind of thing. And I think everybody felt that because we were going into space, we were flying rocket planes, that uh, cars would soon be the same. It was the dawn of the jet age. The sky was the limit. And automakers seized on concept cars, one-of-a-kind prototypes, as a way to get buyers excited about the more down-to-earth production models for sale in the showroom. Some were designed as show cars to show styling or as test beds for power plants. And some were designed as test beds for power plants that never existed and never will exist, like atomic power, which is totally impractical for automobiles, but it sounded so sexy in the 50s. Some had forward-looking names like Futura, the 1956 Ford concept that became television's first Batmobile. Others, like this 1956 Buick Centurion, were handmade rolling wonders that contained materials virtually unheard of in automobile manufacturing at that time. Plexiglass, fiberglass, magnesium, plus a healthy dose of electronics. One of the most interesting things about this car is the little 4-inch by 6-inch TV screen on the dashboard. It's actually hooked up to a camera in the tail, and it replaces the rear view mirror. Why use a TV screen when just a plain old mirror would do? They used a closed circuit television screen because they could. They were showing off. It was, they were showing what was possible. It was an idea. The idea for building the car of the future dates back to the 1930s. During that time, the novelty of the automobile was so overwhelming that looks took a backseat to function. Most cars looked alike boxes on wheels with running boards. The coach builder's focus was less on fashion and more on useful innovations like self-starters and four-wheel brakes. But one man believed a car's ability to transport people was only one part of its appeal to car buyers. Automobiles could also be beautiful. That radical idea was proposed by General Motors design chief Harley Earl. Harley Earl began the trend of having the vehicles, the products, designed by designers and not by engineers. People that understood the arts, that had a fine arts background, and eventually evolved into what we know it today. Under Earl's leadership, GM's new offerings led the industry to adopt flamboyant, passionate shapes and emotional designs. More than just a way to get around, cars were evolving into sculptures. One of the things that Harley Earl and his design staff used uh, earlier than almost anybody else was clay to model their cars in three dimensions. They would paint it, they would put metallic finish on it to simulate chrome, and it gave an idea of what that car might look like when it was finished. In 1938, Earl created an alluring prototype that was more graceful in its design than anything else on the road. This was the Buick Y-Job, the first true concept car. Its name came from fighter planes. The letter Y was used to designate new warplanes being developed by the aircraft industry. And Harley Earl used the term job to refer to his project cars. And it provided a, uh, a roadmap for the future of Buick. If you look at the technology the vehicle had, you know, hidden headlamps, recessed tail lamps, curved glass, you know, very underslung look, very low, very sexy looking automobile, you know, really ahead of its time. Because the handmade car would have been prohibitively expensive to mass produce, the Buick Y-Job never made it to the assembly line. Harley Earl used the one-of-a-kind dream car as his daily driver. But the Y-Job and the dream cars that would soon follow were the source of all the car styling cliches we now take for granted. Chrome, fins, curved windshields, electric tops, hideaway headlights, and no running boards. When we return, forget about the street. Airplanes inspired the future of automotive design 
and the first show-stopping concept car is unveiled, Le Sabre. Two years after General Motors introduced America's first concept car, the Buick Y-Job, the country entered World War II, and automobile production came to a halt. Instead, Detroit automakers retooled to make war machines, like the Cadillac airplane engines, made for the Lockheed P-38 Lightning aircraft. When the hostilities ended, the legendary pursuit plane, with its huge twin tail booms and curved glass nose, had become the inspiration for the next generation of American dream cars. At the General Motors Proving Grounds outside Detroit, a collection of some of the finest examples of one-of-a-kind concept cars ever produced has been assembled for this program. As they are unloaded, they are handled like works of art, each a masterpiece each a treasure of automotive history. They represent the heritage of General Motors and America's fascination with dream cars of the 1950s. One of the crown jewels of the collection was first seen by the public in 1951. Designed by Harley Earl, its huge twin tail fins seem plucked right off the Lockheed P-38. Its brake light looks like a jet thruster port, and its curved windshield suggests the glass canopy of a fighter jet. Its name also came out of the sky. Named after a fighter jet, the F-86 Sabre, this was a true dream car. The 1951 Buick LeSabre. When I look at all the concept cars, Right up through today, the Sabre is probably one of the most significant and one of the all-time favorites. As General Motors design director, Jerry Palmer carried on the legacy that began more than 60 years ago when Harley Earl first envisioned the LeSabre. Certainly heavily influenced by aircraft. You have to remember when that car was done, which was back in the, uh, in the late 40s, early 50s, uh, how radical that it was. And you look at the features, the, the hidden headlamps, the, uh, the twin tail fins, the fuselage body with these beautiful uh, shapes, these sculpted shapes, and the panoramic windshield. The LeSabre's windshield was an automotive first. Glass with curves and contours had never been used on an automobile before. The so-called panoramic windshield on the LeSabre offered improved driver visibility, less air turbulence, and a one-of-a-kind styling detail. But the LeSabre concept car had more going for it than just a pretty face. Road noise and bumps were absorbed by some of the first gas-filled shock absorbers called air silencers that were fed by their own air pump located in the trunk. That pump also fed four hydraulic jacks mounted above each wheel. After lifting the fender skirts and locking them in place, they could be switched on from inside, allowing the driver to easily change a flat tire. Under the hood, LeSabre sported a 215 cubic inch V8 that delivered more than 300 horsepower. The performance of the vehicle with 335 horsepower for its day had to be quite electrifying. You consider the rest of the cars of that time frame probably had 0 to 60 uh, times around 14 to 15 seconds. This car was certainly under 10 seconds, which was quite fast for its day. Such astounding performance was made possible because the engine had a 10 to 1 compression ratio and included a supercharger. A compressor driven by the engine that supplied a jet of high-pressure air to the cylinders to speed up combustion and engine performance. The engine also burned a unique combination of fuels. Gasoline on that side, alcohol on this side. Had aircraft carburetors. Right under the manifold, you'll see the uh, supercharger. 
which came off of General Motors' uh, uh, diesel uh, application. So a tremendous amount of technology when you think when this was done, 215 cubic inch aluminum motor putting out 335 horsepower. Quite a, quite a feat for its day. And it, the structure of the hood, this is all magnesium. Keep the weight of the vehicle down wherever they could. In the cockpit, the LeSabre offered its pilot a full complement of instruments, including an altimeter and compass in the dash. Speedometer, rheostat, a cruise control, first car with cruise control. Power windows, one of the first cars with power windows. Top. The convertible top was motorized and was triggered to close automatically by a moisture sensor between the seats that detected the first sign of rain. Still, it was the LeSabre's outrageous sense of style and proportion that would set it apart from anything else on the road at the time. Built of fiberglass and cast magnesium on a 115-inch wheelbase, the low-slung LeSabre stood a mere 36 inches high at the top of the cowl and appeared to glide as it rushed along the open road on 13-inch wheels. Can you imagine what people were thinking when they saw this car on the road? You just take a look at it. The proportion of this thing is so dramatic, very low, wide, very long. There's no substitute for great proportions in anything, especially in great automobiles. Full-page advertisements in Life magazine trumpeted the car to an enthusiastic public. But the car itself was never for sale. Features like power windows and hidden headlights would one day appear on production cars. But with the 1951 LeSabre, Buick was marketing the future. It feels remarkably unique. For instance, the driving position, having the wheel this close to your chest is something that only NASCAR drivers experience. And the other thing that you, you sense is the, is the mass of the vehicle. It feels very underslung, very massive, but yet it's, it's, it's quite docile. It feels extremely solid. It feels wonderful. The LeSabre had kicked off an ideas race in the 1950s. Styling for the future became the pulse of the American automobile industry. Buick's next concept car was a model named XP300. Unlike LeSabre, its design called for a higher stance. This would allow more room for the engine and mechanics underneath. It's a little bit more conservative than the LeSabre, for example. It doesn't have fins. It has very many of the design elements that would be used in future Buick cars. Side spears and, and the waterfall grill and the, the, the headlight treatment it was very similar to what you would find on a regular uh, Buick of the era. America's post-war appetite for new cars was potentially huge, but car makers still faced the challenge of how to lure customers into their showrooms. Dream cars would provide the answer. When we return, concept cars become the greatest show on earth and the dawn of America's sports car, the Corvette. Does this Cadillac look a little small? What about this Buick? Of course, they were designed that way. Back seats are for real cars. These dream cars had a different purpose in the 1950s, to look graceful and alluring on a stage. The stage was called the Motorama, a brilliant multi-million dollar roadshow put on by General Motors. GM produced its first traveling Motorama in 1953 and recruited help from the Barnum and Bailey Circus to stage the elaborate dance numbers and special effects that were used to promote their cars. People would crowd in and they
would see their favorite Cadillac, their favorite Chevrolet, their favorite Buick, their favorite Oldsmobile, their favorite Pontiac. And in interspersed in, in among the production cars would be dream cars, which would give a hint of what's going to happen in the future. The exotic concept cars were hand-built. Often, the controls didn't work. In many cases, there wasn't even an engine under the hood. But that didn't matter, as long as there were plenty of wings, fins, and bubble tops to dazzle the potential car buyers. As they saw these dream cars, right alongside the dream cars, they saw the new offerings from, from that particular division. And they'd see a relationship between the dream car and the Buick that they could buy. There was the 1956 Buick Centurion. Buick enthusiasts will recognize the sweep spare chrome on the Centurion as being similar to the 1957 Buicks. They might even recognize the rear fins as being like those introduced on the 1959 models. The rest of the car, however, is a one-of-a-kind showstopper that looked as though it had traveled here from outer space. This 56 Buick Centurion is an incredible mid-century fantasy of what a car would look like. Outside, you had a very low silhouette, a plexiglass top that let the sun shine in and let you see out during a sunny day, or even if you were traveling down Broadway at night, you could look up and see all the lights. Inside, you had a steering wheel that was cantilevered. It gave you a lot of room on the floor for your feet. The steering wheel actually hung from a long arm that extended from a central pod in the dashboard, connected to the steering column. You had a lot of aircraft themes. You had a little pods that contained the instruments. The front of this car also evokes the feel of an aircraft. You've got a grill that looks like a jet intake. You've got headlights that look like they're recessed into jet engine pods. All in all, a very futuristic theme. The Centurion was a fully functional automobile with a 325 horsepower V8. But its advanced features, like a video camera in the trunk lid that sent an image of the road to a TV screen in the dashboard, made it too complicated and expensive to mass produce. One of the things that would probably have made it impractical as a production car was the thing that made it most interesting from the outside, and that's a plexiglass roof. Imagine sitting in this out in Palm Springs on a warm summer day. Uh, if the air conditioning failed or something went wrong, you had a problem. It was uh, like being inside a toaster oven. A wide open convertible, on the other hand, conveyed a sense of freedom, as well as a cool breeze. One of the finest examples of a 50s Motorama Roadster has survived in the General Motors collection. In 1953, this was Cadillac's entry into the Motoramas. It's the 1953 Le Mans. It features four headlight system for the first time on a concept vehicle. Features a more modernized tail fin, panoramic windshield, aircraft inspired gauges, even the steering wheel has inlay Cadillac in metal. It really shows the futuristic and aircraft inspired design of the 50s, very 50s car. As a concept car, it was proportioned for drama. Its windshield stood nearly eight inches lower than the standard Cadillac convertible. This made the car body look especially impressive. The interior was also unusually small for a Cadillac. True to their identity as a luxury car, Cadillac interiors were generally very roomy. Up close, there were other details that set the Le Mans apart as a concept car, like the mirrors that were rendered in miniature so they would not detract from the body. One of the telltale signs that you can tell that this is a concept vehicle is that it's made out of fiberglass. Even though it looks like metal, it's not. Fiberglass allowed designers to sculpt a concept car body that contained elaborate compound bends and curves. The experimental Le Mans was named for Cadillac's heritage in the famed 24-hour endurance race. And the Le Mans not only conveyed style, but speed. It was powered by a 331 cubic inch Cadillac V8 stepped up to deliver 250 horsepower. Its performance was enhanced by two air cleaners, a top two four barrel carburetors, and dual exhaust. Although futuristic when it was designed, its styling features soon became familiar trademarks on America's highways.
One of the reasons why the Le Mans does not look like a outrageous show vehicle is that many of the features on this car would ultimately appear on later model Cadillacs. Uh, for instance, the bumper and grille look very much like 54-55 Cadillac, and the quad headlight system on this car appeared on uh, Cadillacs in 1957. Chevrolet's first concept cars appeared on the Motorama stage in 1953. There were three, and all of them were Corvettes. There was the, the Corvette Roadster, Corvette Fastback, and the Corvette Nomad. The Nomad station wagon later emerged in production as a Chevrolet. The Fastback remained a concept car. But the 53 Corvette Roadster became a production vehicle, the same vehicle. So there's a great example of a concept car becoming a real production automobile. Made of fiberglass, just like the concept version, the Motorama Corvette became America's first and best loved sports car. The passion and enthusiasm that the Corvette inspired led GM designers and engineers to develop a racing version aimed at the public. The concept was unveiled in 1959 and named the Corvette Stingray. The 59 Corvette was designed as a race car and possibly one of the most beautiful Corvettes we've ever done and became the role model or the roadmap for the 63 Stingray. So there's another example of a concept car, concept car, race car, paving the way for a future production automobile. Originally painted red, the Stingray's first race was in April of 1959, when it finished fourth, competing against thoroughbred Porsches and race-proven Jaguars. The next year, it won its class in the Sports Car Club of America Championship. Not bad for a car that, with a few changes, would make its way to the American road four years later. All the great Corvettes can trace their lineage back to this car. This car came out in 59. And when I say, what are, the, what, are the, what are the things about this car that you can identify with Corvettes? It's this very sharp, high datum line, the airfoil section with wheel-orientated pods on all four fenders. It's a very sleek, very powerful looking design inspired by Stingrays, hence the name Stingray on the car. The first car to use the name Stingray. The Stingray's first power plant was a 283 cubic inch V8 that produced 280 horsepower. But just months after its first race, the car got a lighter body, painted metallic silver, and a performance boost. This is a 377 cubic inch special small block Chevrolet, about 400 plus horsepower. The thing that's of real particular interest to the performance enthusiasts are these tuned headers, these equal length tuned headers that really help scavenge the engine to generate the high horsepower. It was built for speed but conveyed that message even when it was standing still. 59 Stingray is one of the most gorgeous automobiles that we've ever done. Most concept cars remained only wild ideas, but the Corvette took the fast track from dream car to reality. Driving enthusiasts finally got what they really wanted, a chance to own the dream. When we return, blast off with the Rocket Cars. By 1955, U.S. car production reached its highest point to date, and Americans were treated to ever-increasing fantasies of what the car of the future might be like. This concept car is the 1955 Firebird 1. 
What comes out of here is the exhaust at 650 degrees. And if you stay in one spot long enough on acceleration, you will burn the pavement up in the back of the vehicle. That's a product of a gas turbine. Once thought of as the motor of the future, gas turbines compress air and blow it into a combustion chamber where fuel is added and ignited. The resulting gas is hot, 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. The expanding gases turn a turbine wheel and produce power. This is the gasifier turbine where the fuel hits comes through here and goes back through. And the air intake is over up into the front right here, which is hooked to the gas fire turbine, and it pulls the air through as it spins. It goes into the gearbox and spins the gears in there, and we have the drive system hooked to that. And that goes through your transmission. When the Firebird 1 made its debut at the 1954 Motorama, it was nicknamed the rolling test tube. Even if it didn't yet offer practical transportation, it was a jaw dropper. Firebird 1 was really a R&D design vehicle to showcase gas turbine technology to demonstrate how you could get a, a gas-fired turbine into the uh, everyday automobile. Key on, fuel pump, pressure's up over 100, crank. At the Motorama, spectators were awed by its looks. The needle nose, delta wings, tail fin, and flip-up bubble top. These were aerodynamic features from the cutting edge of aircraft design, never before seen on an automobile. How's it feeling today? Super. Jet on wheels. Ran great. As a prototype for a turbine-powered car, the first Firebird was a rousing success. Film of the turbine-powered wonder in 1954 showed it reaching speeds in excess of 200 miles per hour on an Arizona track. And the flaps were not just for show. At the rear of it, these are uh, flaps to slow you down, which were functional in the day. When you break, they popped up and for slowing you down, breaking, breaking the air. Sure, the flaps served a purpose, but make no mistake, these cars were about showmanship. At the 1956 Motorama, a mysterious new rocket car was unveiled. Through clouds of mist and theatrical effects, the public got its first peek at Firebird 2. Firebird 2 to control tower. We are about to take off on the highway of tomorrow. Stand by. The second generation Firebird was more than just a concept of what cars might someday be like. It included a vision of the future seasoned with a touch of Flash Gordon. The idea of space travel was more real to people than ever. And Detroit seized upon that idea. And they thought, well, why not make cars look like rocket ships? Why not make them look like they would actually drive on the highways of tomorrow, perhaps even by themselves? The Firebird 2 concept car refined gas turbine technology into a quieter, more practical road car. While Firebird 1 had seating for only the driver, Firebird 2 offered room inside for a family of four. All right, on the gauges here, it looks like a cockpit of an airplane because you have all your turbine inlet temperatures and power turbine RPMs and your RPMs of the engine, oil pressure, but again, it is off the concept of a jet aircraft, and you have the uh, instrumentation of a jet aircraft just the same. The Firebird 2 included creature comforts, like air conditioning, power steering, and power windows.
that's hitting the headlights up front, you pull the switch on it, pulls them out either left and right side of the fenders. It also featured an electric hood that raised to reveal its experimental motor. This is a uh, 220 horsepower turbine engine and the transmission is mounted up front here and you have a uh, atomizer pump which goes into the fuel nozzles here and when you're cranking it over there's an air pump that shoots air in there and helps atomize the fuel for a better burn on your light off. Hearing the turbine engine from one of the Firebirds start up is sort of eerie. It has this eerie ethereal whine. And then of course it moves a lot of air, so there's a, a whoosh, a, a hiss that barks out of the exhaust, and it's it's just nothing like any car you've ever heard. At cruising speed, the turbine engine hums along at 28,000 RPM and gets 15 miles to the gallon. It's nice to drive because you hear that turbine engine singing along and it feels like you're cruising in a jet. But gas turbines never beat out piston engines to power automobiles, primarily because gas turbines are made to run at a constant high speed. It also takes several seconds to rev the turbine up enough to move the car. For jet aircraft, that's okay, but not for automobiles that drive in stop-and-go traffic. By the end of the decade, the space-age theme of concept car design would have run its course. But not before Cadillac got in there with one more just exceptionally flamboyant rocket-inspired car called the Cyclone. Now remember in 1959, that was the year the Cadillac had the big fins. Well, so did this one. And the two front pontoon fenders on this car looked like uh, rockets out of, out of something we'd see on its way to the moon in the 60s. The car gives you an extremely good peripheral vision. Uh, you get a 360 panoramic view, uh, which makes it very easy to see around the car. Exhaust ports mounted ahead of the front tires meant that the car was always driving into a cloud of its own exhaust. But with no tailpipes running underneath, Cadillac engineers could drop the chassis down so that the Cyclone rode just a few inches above the pavement. The car features a standard 390 cubic inch uh, Cadillac engine, makes 325 horsepower, and I uh, wouldn't be surprised if this car could top out well over 120 miles per hour. The Cyclone was a rolling laboratory that Cadillac used to test some of its most advanced safety ideas. In the front of the car, the two black domes are radar sensing domes, which gives uh, the car a proximity of what it's approaching, not only in feet, but also how much braking distance you'll need to stop the car. If you're not paying attention to those gauges, it has an audible alarm that increases with pitch as you approach whatever is stationary in the road. The Cyclone's collision avoidance radar was an automotive first, and one that is yet to be perfected for the mass market. The outlandish plexiglass top helped give the Cyclone its science fiction looks, and led to an even more unusual set of features. Because of the one-piece bubble top and the absence of roll-down windows, it necessitated a uh, intercom system so you could communicate with people on the outside as well as a, as a pass-through door which uh, allows you to uh, pass coins through to a uh, toll booth or exchange something with somebody on the outside. The Cyclone marked the end of the 1950s dream car era with style and excitement. But the tradition is alive and well today. When we return, dream cars of the rich and famous for sale. Like real dreams, most dream cars of the 1950s were destined to become fleeting memories. While a few, like the LeSabre and Firebirds, were preserved by their makers, most concept cars were doomed. They were kept by the manufacturers and generally destroyed. 
uh, primarily because they weren't good drivers. They were built to show a particular design theme or design idea or a propulsion idea. And once they had served their purpose, the manufacturers did not have the foresight to save them. The so-called crush rule among Detroit's automakers ensured the cars wouldn't get into the hands of the public where they might be driven and the manufacturer held responsible for any injury or accident that resulted. Still, decades later, a few concept cars have turned up in private collections. Some are even for sale. To my right here, has got a 53 Cadillac Ghia, one of two built worth about $350,000. To my left here, we have a 54 DeSoto Adventure 2. This is the only one in the world, and it's worth somewhere in the area of $450,000. Don Williams is a self-described old car junkie turned dream car dealer. And to the left of the DeSoto, we have uh, the Dodge Firebomb, and this car here is worth about $250,000. Unlike the cars destined for the Crusher, Williams' concept cars were made to be driven. Some were owned by the rich and famous, like Rita Hayworth and the King of Morocco, only adding to their one-of-a-kind mystique. Williams has taken them out to a Las Vegas area country club with a team of handlers and mechanics for some much-needed exercise. The jewel of this collection the 1954 Adventurer II, a concept car by DeSoto. It was purchased from parent company Chrysler in 1956 by the King of Morocco after two years on the show circuit. The DeSoto Adventurer II was one of the most flamboyant of all the Chrysler idea cars. It was long and low and sort of looked like a rocket ship just flying along the ground. A very extroverted car and uh, one of the wildest of the whole era. Power came from DeSoto's version of the Hemi V8. The 276 cubic inch motor cranked up a respectable 170 horsepower. The Hemi engine got its name from its hemispherical combustion chambers, a feature that increased performance and power. Its outrageous looks were the product of Chrysler's chief designer, Virgil Exner, who sent the car to the Italian design house of Ghia where its one-of-a-kind body was made. Inside, the adventurer's elegant, turned aluminum instrument panel faces a pair of aviation-inspired leather seats, which provide room enough for two. In place of the back seat, we have fitted luggage was put in by the factory. And as you can see, that uh, it's all strapped in and designed specifically for this car. The Adventurer is not the only product of the Chrysler Ghia collaboration in Williams' inventory. This prototype Dodge was built third in a series of top-down concept cars that were named Fire Arrow. For this one-of-a-kind model, designers added back seats and a giant Chrysler power plant. This combination of brawn and beauty was named the Dodge Firebomb. John Workman is part of the team that keeps the cars running and ready for sale. 270 horsepower, uh, probably one of the very first Hemi engines produced by Dodge. The exceptionally large heads, of course, on a Hemi motor, I mean, they're a telltale sign of the car and the sheer power of the engine itself. It has the luxury ride to it. It's smooth, it's very comfortable. As far as handling goes, it's still a car from the 50s, so it still has that handling of a 50s car, that, that big feeling when you turn the wheel. The shift lever is unmarked and came with no park position, a telltale sign that this concept car was made to go, not stop. When you step down on the accelerator, you can feel the engine come to life, all the 270 horses all running at once. It's a feeling that can't be matched anywhere. Williams' collection also demonstrates that Chrysler was not the only domestic car maker that used Italian design studios like Ghia to fashion their concept car bodies. This Cadillac was made in 1953 at the Ghia studio in Turin. It was a custom order for one of Hollywood's most glamorous stars. 
this car would be best known for its one of its former owners, which would be Rita Hayworth. Think of the era in the 50s and, and the grand opulence of Hollywood at the time, and Rita Hayworth driving down Sunset Boulevard waving to her millions of fans at the time. The Rita Hayworth Gear Cadillac, in my opinion, is one of the best ever of that type of car. It's a very voluptuous shape. It's powerful, but somehow still feminine. You'll see a lot of its lines show up in some of the Gear Chrysler cars, and it just looks great going down the road. Many of the uh, designs on the car are way ahead of their time. The uh, spears that you see on the side of the automobile, you'd see in a Ferrari Testarossa in the later years, 30 years after this car was actually on the road. Under the hood was the Cadillac 331 cubic inch V8, the same one used that year in the Le Mans concept car. The air cleaner and valve covers were painted gold to match the Ghia wheels and trim. We love that sound. It gives you a feeling, the rumble, it's low and rich, and it tells you that there's power there. It's just a wonderful feeling to be behind all of that. Best of all, it's available for well under half a million dollars. I think the reason somebody would want to buy one of these design cars today is because they're absolutely beautiful, and they're going to have the only one in the world. objects of art, the dream cars of the 1950s have become priceless. Are they as radical as they were back in the 50s? I think it's kind of uh, in the eyes of the beholder. Some of us think they are, some still love the cars of the 50s. The dream cars gave us a, a true dream and a vision of what we hoped the future would be like. And they were, they were just such beautiful machines. And as with dreams, we admire the concept cars of the 1950s for what they remind us about ourselves.